Hello, and welcome to 45 Streams Filmmaker Conversations. I'm Mallory Martin, the Artistic Director of the Cleveland International Film Festival. We want to give special thanks to PNC for sponsoring our Filmmaker Conversations content throughout the festival this year. On today's special Q&A session, we'll be joined by guests from the documentary Down a Dark Stairwell. I'd like to introduce the director, producer, and cinematographer, Ursula Liang. Ursula is a journalist turned filmmaker who's previously worked for the New York Times. Uh, this is her second feature film after her award-winning documentary, Nine Man, A Streetball Battle in the Heart of Chinatown. She's also not related to one of the subjects of the film, Peter Liang, which we'd like to just state from the beginning. Um, I'm also pleased to introduce Jason Harper. Uh, he's the editor of Down a Dark Stairwell. Uh, Jason is also a documentarian, having made several short documentaries. Uh, this is his third documentary feature as editor. And he's currently editing a documentary about Kanye West, which maybe we, you can tell us a little bit more about later on. Thank you so much uh, to both of you for joining us here today, for sharing your time with us, and for sharing your film with us as well. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Uh, so even though this Q&A won't be released until the festival starts, I actually think we should take a minute to date this pre-recorded session, seeing as it was just less than a week ago that the Atlanta spa shootings uh, occurred, currently sparking Asian American protests around the country, uh, not to mention putting the pressure on the current administration to pass hate crime legislation to address the rise in violence and discrimination against Asian Americans, uh, especially during the COVID pandemic. Uh, so I think where we're at today still is that both federal and state authorities have still declined to officially label this as a hate crime. Ursula, before we deep dive into Down a Dark Stairwell, I imagine that you have thoughts uh, and I'm very eager to hear them, if you can share. Yeah, I mean, my heart goes out to everybody in this moment, Asian and other who are, are mourning um, what happened in Atlanta. And it's it's inspiring to see people come together to um, support um, the community at this time. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's very clear that there was, that, that racism and uh, systemic and historic racism are, are part of what um, happened this week. Um, the term hate crime is very specific, punitive term in our legal system. Um, so I don't know if we'll get there with this with this specific case, but I think it's a very important for people to recognize that um, that the underlying roots of all of this um, are obviously systemic. Great, absolutely. Um, and I just want to say too that in Down a Dark Stairwell, you captured attitudes from both sides that seem to reflect a desire or even a request for solidarity from the two communities. The Black community in the film were asking, you know, where had the Asian American community been during their struggles with police in the past? Can both of you reflect a little bit about what you might see as the Black community's role at this point in time uh, with Asian Americans now on the front line? Mm -hmm. Ursula or Jason, whoever would like to start. Jason, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, th that's a really great question. Um, yeah, I, I think as as you mentioned, the, the documentary works very hard to um, give a sense of equity to both communities um, and to try to, in the end, emphasize the, the fact that solidarity is really the um, the only way forward when working against institutionalized pressures. And I think the Black community um, now, our responsibility is to support the Asian community in the way that the Asian community desires and sees fit. And that's something that hopefully was reflected also in the, the documentary, the way that the, the, um, the Asian American community that was supporting Kai Gurley uh, in, that, in that camp, they made a very um, specific effort to, to be present, um, but to not put themselves on, as the face of a movement that was, uh, the violence wasn't directed towards their community, but they wanted to be allies and show support. And so that's, that's what I think the role of the Black community is now in a time like this. Ursula, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think that it's important when we're talking about racial justice in this country that it's that our collaboration is not transactional. Um, I think that a lot of folks are pointing fingers. You weren't there for this, you weren't there for that, you weren't there for this. Um, and that's sort of a mistake. I think we really need to think about um, 
uh, you know, the common enemy in some ways, like what the things that we're fighting against and and uh, stand up where we can without uh, making it a sort of a tit for tat kind of relationship. These are, you know, uh, coalition building is long term and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like any relationship in this world. You need to like work at these relationships and, and work at becoming family or collaborators or or partners and things. And and there are a lot of uh, pitfalls along the way. It's difficult work, but it's important that it's not transactional. That's an excellent point. Thank you guys for both sharing on that. Um, so to both of you as well, you guys did such an amazing job at how you designed this documentary about such a potentially polarizing subject. I think laying out each perspective like you did for the viewer to really make their own conclusions, it's not an easy thing to do in a documentary, especially one with such emotional topics. So kudos to both of you for doing that. Um, can you both talk a little bit about how that came to be? Was it something that was in your plans from the start? And you know, how did that transition into the, the editing phase of the film as well? Well, it's definitely, um, you know, I come from a background as a journalist, uh, which uh, doesn't mean you make a film in a very specific kind of way, but it does mean that I wanted the audience to find its own way to um, to experiencing the film. And so it, it was always it was always the intent to step back a little bit and and let people see and experience what was happening with the subjects and the subject matter. And and I do believe like when you're looking to change hearts and minds, it's important for people to have their own experience. Their own journey gets them to a, a very different place of internal change than being told what to think or what to do. Um, so we always, we always sort of knew that we wanted to um, we wanted to do something a little, you know, was, this case was actually covered very well by the national media and especially in New York where it happened. Um, and, you know, as a, as a journalist, you always wanted to be the first person on a story telling a scoop that no one has ever seen, you know, about a story that no one's ever seen before. And this was a challenge for me as a storyteller because so many people were, were telling the story in various ways, but what wasn't happening was um, the volume wasn't changing. Um, we were, we were having a lot of pieces that sort of, um, underscored the the intensity and the emotion and the passion that were out in the streets, but not um, not getting to these more quiet places where people were having conversations. And I think that when the volume is very high, it's very hard to listen to. Um, it's very hard to listen to people talk. So um, I think what we did in the edit intentionally was to emphasize a lot of these moments where the where the conversation was was a little bit more. Um, a little bit less heated. And, and those were things that um, were more approachable for the audience. Um, hmm. Yeah, I would, yeah. Agree, I, I would agree with that. And I think um, it was a, a mandate very early on that Ursula made to, to look for parody and to create parody. And in the, some of the screenings that we had along the way before we reached the final cut, um, we used the reactions from those screenings to kind of kind of fine tune the messaging, whether it was leaning one way or the other. Um, because obviously we come to the documentary with a point of view, um, but in the end, it was it was a very deliberate effort to to let the audience decide for themselves and to sort of create empathy, um, enough empathy on either side, so that really the, one of the overriding messages for me personally of the documentary is the difficulty when you look at when you look at um, uh, just reality as it is, as opposed to uh, whatever um, whoever has the megaphone um, on either side mm -hmm. of the state. and it's a it's a much more difficult. Um, but but I, I think the the only way towards the sort of coalition building that Ursula talks about is those like quieter moments um, that that happen on both sides that she that she was there for. Yeah, I, I love that you brought that up and it brings to mind specifically um, some of those conversations happening around uh, tables of food among some of the communities. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, um, you know, I mean, I think on on uh, Akai's family side, that was a lot of family and, and, and groups of people coming together, but there were people outside of the family as well. Um, and then likewise, um, just how you kind of got into some of those, behind some of those closed doors maybe, or into those more quiet, intimate conversations and, and how you as a director w were able to get to those places. Well, it's definitely important to remember that when you're making a film about people of color, food is important and both our communities <laughs> love food. So, um, you know, I know it makes people hungry when they come out of the screening, but, uh, but that's, that's, that's our people. So, um, you know, actually I want to make sure that I give a shout out to um, 
other filmmakers who were who were generous enough to let us use their footage. We came actually late to the story and were able to incorporate footage from other filmmakers who had um, gotten access into various other spaces, particularly mm -hmm. the um, Chinese speaking spaces where I don't actually have the language. Um, mm -hmm. And so I really want to give a shout out to those folks. Um, it takes it takes a lot of people to make a film and, and we were lucky enough to build relationships with them to include that in our film. But um, you know, for me, with working with the Asian American community, I had done a film in Chinatown, um, Nine Man, that took me like almost seven years to make. And so I had a lot of relationships in Chinatown. And so my introductions into this space came through a lot of those relationships. Um, I do think that, you know, when you're accessing the Asian American community, it's very it's sort of like introduced to one another kind of um, thing is, is actually an important part of, of relationship building. So. Um, that's that's how I um, got to folks, and and I but I, you know I literally started by meeting somebody at a big protest who then introduced me to somebody else. But they had sort of folks knew me a little bit from um, from the past film, and then with the um, Akai Gurley family, um, we actually did the same thing. We w we walked up to some folks. Uh, we went to a protest. Um, I thought it would be a little bit problematic to approach people on paper with my last name. Um, so I went to a protest. I, you know, have I've always um, been very careful about who I bring with me when I'm crewing up. And so the first time we approached that community, I was with another black filmmaker, um, Lyric Cabral, who's an amazing documentarian herself. And um, we went, uh, and and some folks recognized Lyric. Um, and uh, and uh, you know that the first interaction with Akai's aunt um, was on the streets and. I told her, you know, what my last name was, and she was like, "Yes, it probably would have been problematic and triggering if you, if you emailed me." Um, but uh, she was very generous and, and understood sort of the value of having media along for for the ride, and allowed us to like pin a mic on her right away. And um, and that same day, we walked around the pink houses with with her. So um, we were very lucky that um, she and the other activists were very open to open it, you know, to some extent to having us. Um, be around them. I mean, I think it was a little bit more difficult with the Asian American community. The Asian American community is not as um, comfortable with exposing itself to media. So I think that the access points there were a little more, more difficult. Um, surprisingly, I think people would think that I had an easier time there. But um, my main goal with, you know, with with the Akai Gurley side was to really approach folks in, in person um, because of the last name problem. You know, and it, for folks who know Chinese culture, this is like one of the top top 10 names, it's a very popular name, uh, but it, but uh, in America it's not, so. Hmm. Hmm. Well, and you just mentioned about who you brought with you on your crew. And I think that, um, you know, that was something you were very deliberate about as well. Um, and, and, you know, for not only in front of the camera, but also behind the camera for, you know, you to focus um, specifically on including BIPOC creatives. And, and I think it's very interesting that, um, that there were no interviews with any white people in the film. Oh, you noticed um, that. <laughs> you noticed yeah, that people and, were missing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, because Jason, you you talked about how parody was so important to Ursula as well. So, mm -hmm. um, can you talk more? I mean, that's that's a lot. So maybe that's a two part uh, question. I guess really is about the importance of who's behind the camera, and, and then also to address um, your decision to not include any any white white interviews as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it felt necessary that we had like a black and Asian team. It just felt like we can't do this story without, without um, our, you know, without us being represented in the edit and, and, you know, spending months and months with Jason in the edit and um, many months before that with our consulting producer, Chanel Aponte Pearson, like you, it becomes very clear why you need diversity on your team. Like their, their mm -hmm. ideas and brilliant creative ideas and also like political thoughts that folks have that that you would never even um, think about if you're not from that, that group. And so I feel like we had a lot of really interesting discussions and I, I feel kind of blessed that the journey of the film was, was a learning experience for me too. And we were sort of trying to model that, like that relationship building as we were working. Um, so it, you know, it, it actually takes a little bit you know, it takes a lot of work to to diversify your teams, and a lot of people are not willing to put in the work. They they want to work with folks they're comfortable with, and those are oftentimes the people they go to film school with who look like they do. And it, it um, you know, it it really takes a lot of effort as a producer to diversify your team. Um, so I'm I'm quite proud of myself for doing that. Um, we we didn't. Um, 
you know, we, we definitely had a lot more white voices in the film at some point, but, you know, part of this is that this was a, the, a very rare opportunity for us to tell a story that didn't exist within the sort of black white binary in terms of uh, race. And um, it was a, it was really a conversation between our communities that we wanted to create. And it felt like we needed to elevate those voices. Um, there were tons of commentators of different types on this topic, and we really wanted to um, elevate the stories and the voices that just don't get to be heard all the time. So, um, you know, even even visually, we 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 took folks out. You know, we would we mm -hmm. you know we have all these interstitial moments with reporters and things like that, and um, there we we made an, an effort to like to remove them visually as well. Yeah, I, I think. Uh... Uh, and this sort of ties into your last question as well, um, in terms of the access to those communities. I think um, Ursula had the idea to make sure that the that the B-roll wasn't just B-roll, but that that it was pur purposeful and deliberate. And even being able to be at like a birthday party, or you know, even if you're not at a protest itself, you're on the way to the pink house. It's like you're in a train, just existing with someone before they get there. To try to. Um, uh, Oftentimes, when our communities hit the um, hit the news cycle, it's because something has gone wrong, um, like what just happened in the Asian American community. And what frequently happens in the Black community is that these like peaks of violence happen, and then all of a sudden, that's how we end up in. I show those communities to show that like this moment of violence was like a wrinkle in what was an already existing community, um, and uh, in a community that is not defined by that kind of violence that happens, that, that, that interrupts it. So, um, yeah, it's a, a, a little bit tying into the last one, but it, uh, the fact that there were no white faces in those communities, I think is hopefully a good insight into the fact that even when we're not talking about the violence that happened, that I can show that these are like living, breathing communities that exist, um, mm. you know, uh, in harmony um, until something unfortunate like this happens. I mean, in some ways, I don't want to, um, you know, we're in this moment where there is a lot of um, insecurity in the country about sort of the changing racial dynamics. And uh, and I think that a lot of what we've seen over the last administration is the sort of the uprising of fears that people of color are, you know, and our voices are taking over, um, which I don't think is fully true. But I, we didn't like purposefully, you know, I don't want to sound like, um, you know, as a, a director, I was like willfully erasing folks in a in a mm. in an evil way, but I think it, it's more you know it's sort of like more the opposite, which is like uplifting, uplifting voices that are often that are often being erased, and um, and 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 I think in reality the the film really presented itself that way. It was not you know we might have we might have uh, chosen to not include one one person, but these these spaces were largely people of color, and we're living in a you know we're living in a city where people are. A very racially segregated um, where our communities, you know, when I go shoot in East New York, it's black and brown faces. When I go shoot in Chinatown, it's it's Asian faces and some tourists, you know. So um, that there's a reality to that, and and I think that there's oftentimes this false reality that we're living in this very multicultural, very integrated um, society, especially like in a place like New York. But it's 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 not that way. We have some of the, like the most ra racially segregated school systems here in the country. And, um, you know, it's, uh, anyway, it was, it was, uh, both, a, a conscious thing, but not like a deliberate attempt to, to silence. Right. Well, uh, so Cleveland of course is, is no stranger to police violence, particularly against BIPOC communities. It was, I think only two days after a guy was shot, um, that Tamir Rice was killed in 2014 in Cleveland. Um, and in this case by a white officer, uh, who, by the way, the DOJ just decided in December that they uh, would not have any uh, criminal charges brought against him, uh, so officially closed the case. Um, and this was a 12-year-old uh, who was shot within two seconds of the cop's arrival in broad daylight, you know, no dark stairwell figure. Um, without undermining the important theme of solidarity in this film, can we shift the discussion for a moment um, towards what I think both both sides or both communities in the film agreed was the overarching problem, which is white supremacy. Um, are the two of you able to share your own thoughts about how you think Akai's case would have gone differently if Peter was a white cop? 
Oh, it's hard to speculate. Um, yeah. you know, this did happen. It's, it's important that you're putting this in a moment in time, um, you know, a couple of days before Tamir Rice and a couple of months after Eric Garner. Um, so Eric Garner, black man killed by a white cop, um, that happened in Staten Island, which is a much more conservative place than Brooklyn, um, but also part of New York. Um, and I think that that you know that happened right around Mike Brown too. So Mike Brown and Eric Garner, the the movement of Black Lives was really um, had gained so much momentum in the four months leading up to this case. Um, so I think there were a lot of things that um, that sort of laid in line for this this case to go as it did. Um, and uh, you know Brooklyn is a, a pretty um, well I don't know it's got a it's got a big mix of folks, but it you know it's typically much more liberal than than a place like Staten Island. And and I think the you know the juries had been and the the public had been primed um by the movement you know by the organizers that had been like fighting and fighting for months so the outcome was definitely going to be different i think in this case um you know obviously the arguments of the people in the film are that um that peter leung was you know was was singled out because of his race um, and I can remember some other cases around the same time. There were other, um, you know, there were a few other convictions of uh, cops around the country, but again, they weren't like, they weren't part of like sort of the old boys network of um, of cops, which doesn't, you know, I mean, in, in New York, there was a black cop that was, that had uh, shot somebody point blank in, in their car. I think he was off duty and he also uh, got off um, around this time, but there was also like an immigrant um, uh, uh, an immigrant cop that uh, that got convicted. So there was, you know, sort of people who sort of fell outside of that old boys network, whether it whether that was race based or not, uh, were a little bit more, I don't want to say vulnerable to the system, but accountable to the system. Um, I also wanted to mention, like you mentioned Tamir, and, and because we're in Cleveland right now, um, there's a, a moment at the end of the film where a father stands up and talks about, there's sort of this echo of other cases um, that uh, where where people were killed, their their black sons were killed by by or or loved ones were killed by police, and um, there was a case um, that was that spent a lot of time. You know, we spent a lot of time filming them. It didn't end up being a big part of the story, but um, but uh, there was a, a father whose son had been killed like twenty years earlier in a very similar case to Tamir Rice, but it was like a, it was almost like a blend of Tamir versus Akai, where he was playing with a a gun, a plastic gun in a, in a stairwell of a housing project and was mm -hmm. shot. Um, and I believe that was a, a black cop, but um, so he speaks up at the end of the film. And I just wanted to make that that parallel because it was a it was a case that really feels like it dovetails with both of these. And um, it's very sad. Um, and he and, and it was, you know, one of the things that I thought found really moving about the movement, um, the Akai Gurley movement, was that uh, there were so many um, there's so much like mutual support between these family members, and it's it's an awful sort of like unific you know point of unification. But they're sort of um, you know all of these loved ones of men who had been killed were coming together and supporting each other and showing up for each other over and over and over again. And it was something beautiful that came out of this terrible moment. These terrible moments. I think it it will be also interesting if we're talking in hypotheticals. To, to think towards the future rather than look at the past, the precedent, which I think is, pretty, is like there are lots of examples of what has happened with white officers. Um, but in the future, I, I actually feel that like, the, like with Peter, uh, that may become more of a norm as the country becomes more diverse over time, mm -hmm. looking towards 2040 when we're supposed to have a uh, majority minority population as the police force becomes more mixed, I think it'll begin to raise questions about the institution of policing period that we're seeing a lot of what's called kind of radical talk now about reforming the institution. Um, but as, as what is often um, uh, associated with white supremacy, i.e. the police force, especially when it, when it um, presents itself at, you know, in the form of an officer with his knee on somebody's uh, neck. Um, I think it'll only become more complicated uh, as as the police force begins to integrate more fully. And um, unfortunately, as these sort of incidents happen, I, I think uh, the, the sort of an overriding um, 
thing that will happen is that we'll begin to look at these institutions as institutions and stop s- stop separating. Um, well, I don't know. That's a, probably a huge rabbit trail, but I think it will be very interesting <laughs> what happens when another case like this happens. Um, and uh, and hopefully Ursula will be there with the camera for that one as well. But we'll see. No, hopefully it won't happen at all, and no one will be there with the camera. That's the, that's what I'm. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we won't we won't have to deal with it. But I, I think it's it's a um, when people watch the film, I hope they be begin to. Um, Ursula said the word systematic earlier. Like when you look at the system, look at the institutions that are protecting the individuals and sort of wiping them clean of of actions that happened. And in, in essence, sort of erasing these things that happen um, from from like individual action. Um, yeah, it will be interesting to see what the what the future holds. Um, when, when something, hopefully, this won't happen again. Uh, but yeah, but it will. But it will. Well, so it's interesting you mentioned future, even sort of what's happening now, as opposed, you know, because twenty fourteen. Which when did you start filming? We actually started, sure. the case happened in 2014 and we started filming in 2016. 2016, okay, yeah. which is crazy. I mean, that's still, you know, five, six, up, well, you know, seven years ago now already. But so I wanted to to make sure not to forget to mention Aunt T because she's, she's pretty incredible. And, and obviously she was such a huge part of the film and has been instrumental in the, in the fight for justice for Akai. Um, like you said, in 2014, that was really kind of, um, around the time that the Black Lives Matter movement was was gaining a lot of traction, um, although it felt very ingrained in the fight for Akai already. Um, do you know at this point in time, is Akai's family still in this fight now in 2021? Are they aligned with Black Lives Matter still? Uh, uh, Auntie still shows up um, to events. She definitely goes out and protests and, and the rest of the folks in the film are still very involved. Um, and, and I know for sure that the folks that were supporting Peter Leung were doing stuff around this anti-Asian um, violence too. I, I was sent mm-hmm. a you know a Zoom link for uh, some sort of vigil this weekend um, by all the folks that were involved in that. Um, um, you know, one of the things that I did want to mention that some people don't think about is that the activism for the family members is you know, it, it, it means a lot of things. It can be, you know, that you notice that auntie was the one that was sort of like the main, um, the main person speaking out. And it was hard for like Akai's um, mom and family members to participate. And, and one of the things that happens is that, um, you know, folks are being asked to speak out on behalf of their loved one, but they also, um, you know, in, in doing that, they don't always have the opportunity to mourn. So it's this really sort of, you know, they get caught in this cycle of having to like stand up and protest, um, but never actually um, deal with the trauma that they've been handed. And so I think that there are usually waves of um, waves of momentum. I mean, now, yes, it has been many years, but I'm sure after sort of like the bulk of all this happened, there was a there were moments where um, the family members started to be ac- actually be able to mourn and some and some who had to withdraw because they couldn't they couldn't process their feelings at the same time as stand up. So I think we have to think about that every time we see, you know, like a Mike Brown senior standing up and and saying stuff and and that sort of the, the double trauma of dealing with press media, a movement and and dealing with a lost one is is uh, really a lot for people to deal with. Um, I also know that they, they've they done some small things related to this case since, like they've been able to get uh, a street named after a Kai in, in East New York. Um, and I know that, I'm not sure if he's related or not, but I know in this, during, uh, I can't remember what month it was, but you know, over over the pandemic period, um, football players were allowed to wear um, political slogans on, on their jerseys. And I know that somebody wore Kai's uh, name on his jersey. So there've been a few things that have happened since. I think even, I um, can't remember which player it was, but another football player wore a tie with a Kai that had, uh, you know, a number of black men's names on it to, uh, uh, a Hall of Fame ceremony, uh, and and I think Akai was included on that. Yeah, and, and part of the reason I, I bring that up now is just very recently, um, uh, you know, Tamir's case has been in the in the news again too, with uh, Tamir's mother, Samiria, kind of calling out um, some activists for her feeling that um, you know, particularly the Black Lives Matter movement using 
her son's death as as um, she framed it as clout chasing, which which I thought was um, you know interesting. And and I think since she's she's backpedaled a little bit in terms of of calling that out. But I I think if I, I don't know if you guys can talk a little bit more about where you think um, I guess both the Black Lives Matter movement and then especially what's what's happening with Asian Americans right now too. What what the future is for movements like that and and is it is it more about um collaborating and and moving on from some of these this trauma um at at this point if, if you guys can talk about what you think the future of, of movements like that would be oh i definitely hear this clout chasing thing i mean i think that's uh anytime cameras are out people are um gathering social media followers and and uh, not necessarily in it for the right reasons. And I think there are little moments of that you can see in our film, you know, even we didn't, we didn't, uh, you know, really, we, a lot of it's subtle. You'll see it in the B-roll, you know, the pictures behind somebody's head when they're, you know, in their office or whatever. But um, it's, uh, you know, in, in this case, there was also very specific things like Al Sharpton was, was very much trying to be involved in this. And then the family members, you know, there was there was a lot of like political positioning around the Akai case at some point, and um, and uh, you know even Quentin Tarantino came out and spoke out on behalf of Akai, and so um, and and there's there's definitely that happening right now with this anti Asian movement where a lot of folks are trying to make a name for themselves, and so I think you always have to be aware of the political negotiating that's happening around these movements, and uh, you know sometimes it's very useful. Sometimes these folks can bring. Um, Audience, their audiences to the table, and 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 uh, the movements can grow, um, and, and we need you know you need all the foot soldiers, and you need all the attention to be able to move some of these uh, these issues forward. But um, you know, it's it's a balance. You know, the authenticity of someone's participation is is something that you have to like be aware of. But you know what what it, you know you also sometimes want to accept whatever you can get to make to make things go to move, make things move. I mean. It, mm -hmm. by any means necessary sometimes, right? You know, to hmm. give that phrase. And th there's an interesting line in the film uh, where a woman on the street uh, and, and an Asian American man are, are speaking on the sideline of a protest. And she says that the black community is not appeased by a, a, a conviction. We're not appeased by it, but it is something that we expect. And it brings in the, the, the question around what is the future of of these advocacy groups, um, the question of what justice actually is is a really difficult one to answer. Because once something is broken, it can't like it can't be you can't bring a Kai back, um, and Peter can't like unshoot his gun. Um, but the the idea of like a, appeasement uh, or, uh, or what what justice actually means is is something that that advocacy groups will continue to have to grapple with. And, and redefine and try to figure out like what, you know, the, I, it, it was always remarkable to me looking at what the, the end result of the case, I guess everyone who's watching this has probably seen the film, the, not, not to spoil it, but in the end, um, what happened in this case is what happens, you know, when we're in war uh, overseas, where it's basically we pay for life with, with money. Um, and that is a, you know, it's a, it's a it's a token um, meant to try to appease, but I, I always find that moment in the documentary really powerful. Where, where it's, we are not appeased by by what happens, but we expect it. And then what is that weird zone that like where that transaction happens, uh, but nothing is really. But it, and you sort of close the book on something maybe, but like is justice met? I don't know. It's it's a it's an open question um, mm -hmm. that I think. Advocacy, advocacy groups will have to continue to, to ask and try to drill down to. Yeah, we're not talking enough about the sort of the civil suits and the awards and the these cash payments that are happening in exchange for the death of black lives. Um, uh, you know, we've just had the most, the, the biggest settlement ever in the George Floyd case, but you know, people mm -hmm. forget that that's not a punishment for the, the, the cops. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, punish the system at all. That is literally taxpayer money. Right, right. Literally, our money coming out of our pockets that is going to the family, and um, and even for people who don't care about anybody's lives, that don't care about racial justice, the the folks around the country who, by and large, care about themselves and their own pockets, like let's be smarter about this. Like you right. um, could save some money by advocating for these systems to change. Right. 
Right. Um, and I don't know why people hmm. talk about that more. Right. Well, well um, I just, the one last point I wanted to make about the film too that, that I really loved was, um, was towards the end and, and all the, um, the sort of montage of the archival footage of, of past civil rights movements too, I thought was a really great way to close out the film. Um, and I think it, it, it sort of relates to what we're talking about here today in terms of what the future is like for these groups, but sometimes it is good to look at where we've come from as well and, and what's, what's led the way. So I just, I, I wanted to point that out as a, a beautiful part of the film as well. Um, so with this, your second feature film, Ursula, uh, behind you, um, and Jason, it, it sounds like you have um, some stuff in the future coming your way too. Do you guys want to talk about what's next for both of you? I'll be quick and say that I'm sort of trying to play a support role for some other filmmakers. I'm working on a great film by um, Tad Nakamura about his father who's living with Parkinson's and uh, it's called Third Act and developing a number of other projects. Um, and potentially working on another Asian American themed project, which will um, hopefully be of interest to folks when it comes out. And and Jason is working on something that I've been wanting to hear more about, so I don't know how much he can share. Not much, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll dodge the question uh, as well in, in terms of the, the future. Uh, but yeah, I'm working on a documentary on uh, Kanye West that's mostly built out with archive um, sort of before he was Kanye from the from the late 90s, early 2000s, before his album release. So that'll be uh, coming out later this year, um, like quarter four of this year. Awesome. All right. Well, I just want to thank you both again for spending time with us today and for sharing this incredible film with our audience. I wish you both the best of luck with your future projects, um, and hopefully we can bring you to Cleveland in person one day. I'd love that. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Yeah, of course. I also want to thank you, our audience, for joining us for today's Q&A session. Uh, we want to be here without your ongoing support to bring film home. Please consider supporting our challenge match presented by Cuyahoga Arts and Culture to support the future of our festival. Our goal is to reach $145,000 this year, and we're so grateful for any amount that you're able to contribute. To donate, purchase tickets, or check out our full schedule of filmmaker conversations like this one, please visit clevelandfilm.org. With that, please stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time.